Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining today's webinar on the carbon-free power sector. I'm Suzanne Vassal, I'm the President and CEO of the U.S. Japan Council, and I'm very glad to have you all with us. As we get started, just a quick reminder about interpretation. Uh, we have information showing on the um, screen with how you can access a Japanese interpretation uh, or continue to listen in English. So please follow the instructions available there. Now, the U.S.-Japan Council's mission is to foster and connect leaders to strengthen U.S.-Japan relations. In the past year, we've been looking at ESG broadly and climate more specifically. We've hosted a bilateral ministerial level climate dialogue. We've provided updates from COP26 negotiators, and we've offered insights from next generation leaders working on sustainability. Today, we turn to a more technical topic, the carbon free power sector, and come at it with the USJC lens of cross sector collaboration. To do this, we partnered with the academic experts of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, OIST Foundation, and the experts in deploying climate solutions at the Pacific International Center for High Technology Research, PICTER, to bring you today's program. Now, US Japan Council's work is made possible through generous grants and corporate and individual gifts. And I'd like to take a moment to, take the to thank the following supporters. Uh, our platinum supporters include Amazon, the Aritani Foundation, Deloitte, and Fabit. Our title sponsors include the Central Pacific Bank, Google, Hitachi, Itoen, Mitsui & Company, MUFG, NEC, Oryx, the Terasaki Nibei Foundation, the Toshizo Watanabe Foundation, and Toyota Research Institute. We're also supported by a number of uh, signature sponsors. Uh, you can see them listed here on the slide. And it's a really wonderful collection of Japanese and American companies, as well as very generous individuals uh, who support us. Continuing on, we have our list of premier sponsors, and we have a couple slides here. And just like to take a moment to share some of the generos generosity we have from our board leaders and corporate <clears throat> sponsors in both countries and across many different sectors. And we also have our gold sponsors. Um, which include, again, many uh, members, board members, and individuals, as well as uh, companies. USJC also depends on the many contributions of our over 600 members, including many who made today's program possible. David Jaynes, who is president and CEO of the OIST Foundation, and from PICTER, president and CEO Dennis Teranishi, and many other USJC members and friends who are close to PICTER, including Naoki Nagai, today's moderator, as well as Veronica Roca, founder and principal consultant at Essential Leap LLC. So now I'm gonna turn the program over to Naoki and Naoki is truly a special person. He self describes on Twitter as mathematician, sustainable technology consultant, ESG quant, and impromptu pianist. A polymath such as Naoki <laughs> is perfect to help us navigate the intersections of policy, s and and business for today's discussion. So Naoki, over to you. Thank you, Suzanne, for the introduction. Now, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad to be here moderating this distinguished panel. And today we have uh, three panelists here with me. Yeah, Ms. Momoko Nagasaki from TEPCO, and then also Gabriel Shear from Elemental, and Dr. Hiroki Kitano from OIST. And before uh, I will be introduce them individually later on, but let me first provide some background of today's webinar topic. And <clears throat> well, as a background, there is a very ambitious target set on both US and Japan. In January, 20, January 2021, President Biden uh, set ambitious goal to meet the urgent demands of the climate crisis, to lead a clean energy revolution, and puts the United States on an irreversible path to zero carbon economy by 2050. About the same time in January, also January 2021, and then Prime Minister Suga stressed his resolve to create a carbon-free society 
as the growth drivers and re-emphasize that Japan would achieve carbon neutral by 2050. And you can see the parallel that both countries is committing to very ambitious goal of reaching carbon neutral economy by 2050. And then also not only that, the both countries are trying to use, uh, trying to position this as an opportunity to make it a growth driver for both countries. Well, this alignment is uh, <clears throat> formalized in April of 2021, when Prime Minister Suga and President Biden met in person in Washington, DC. And then they agreed on the US-Japan climate partnership. This partnership contains a three um, component. The first is to cooperate and have a dialogue on climate ambition and the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And secondly, uh, to collaborate on climate and clean energy technology and also innovation. And the third is to cooperate on accelerating the transition to a decarbonized society in the third countries, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. So now that they, these two countries are agreeing on this very ambitious goal, uh, but how does this is going to be realized in practice? So let's turn our uh, let's turn to the power sector, which is going to be the the largest sector which contributes to decarbonization. And as you can see, both the United States and Japan has made a really big improvement or investment into renewable energy. This graph shows the share of renewables in electricity generation. And as you can see, both Japan and the United States, very similar path. Uh, in 2010, the ratio of renewables in generation was about 10%. And in, in only a decade, they have doubled this proportion to about 20%. Uh, this is a doubling and there's a lot of uh, fast paced changes happening here. But in the meantime, some countries in Europe has been pushing this even more aggressively. As you can see, for example, in the United Kingdom, they've uh, really increased the ratio of renewables to as high as 40% or more. But still, by 2050, if you want to go 100%, I mean, if you want to go decarbonize the economy totally, and there is a long way to go. And so that's the today's discussion. So what, how can we do this? And it will involve likely many different factors. For example, policy toward carbon free power sector. And then also the scientific and technological advancements because the low hanging fruit of introducing renewables and existing technology has been already done. So the more you go, the farther away we, we go, it's gonna be more challenging. So what are the need, needed scientific and technological uh, innovation? And the third topic will be a uh, new business models. If you make these kind of drastic changes, it's going to be uh, affecting not only the technology and the way things are done, but it will require the new business models for power sector itself. And then the second topic we would like to discuss with this group is that how could the bilateral relationship between our two nations could contribute to realizing these very ambitious goals. And that is why uh, we have put together this great panel of experts uh, to start this important dialogue in how to reach this ambitious carbon-free power sector goal. So without further delay, let me introduce the three panelists today. Uh, first, we have uh, Momoko Nagasaki. Uh, let me introduce her. Uh, in 2021, Momoko Nagasaki was appointed as the Managing Executive Officer of TEPCO Holdings with the duties of Chief Marketing Officer, ESG Officer, and Chief Spokesperson. Since joining TEPCO in 1992, she has gained experience in the sales department and the management reform division and was appointment, appointed um, president and CEO of TEPCO Customer Service, a retail subsidiary of TEPCO in 2017, managing director of TEPCO Energy Partner in 2019, 
and Managing Executive Officer of Tepco Holdings in 2020. She is Tepco's first female executive to have spent her entire career exclusively at the company. She is also a member of the Board of Directors of Toden Real Estate and a member of the Board of Directors of eMobility Power, which is engaged in the installation of quick chargers for electric vehicles and expansion of charging networks. Next, we have uh, Mr. Gabriel Shear, Director of Innovation at Elemental Accelerator. Gabriel works with Elemental Accelerator's energy and mobility portfolio companies and partners. He is able to leverage his deep experience with mobility companies, as well as consulting experience working in renewable and energy efficiency to help Elemental portfolio companies grow and thrive. In addition, he is actively seeking partnerships with others who can help portfolio companies grow, co-designing projects with entrepreneurs and additional stakeholders, as well as leading diligence and recruitment for the mobility and energy portfolio. He is eager to help shift the global paradigm away from carbon-based mobility and energy, and sees supporting and elevating entrepreneurs as a key piece of that effort. Gabriel has the unique distinction of having worked for the three different micromobility companies, including being on the founding team as the first government relations hire at Lime, the e-scooter company, and also worked in microtransit and in car sharing and advised various mobility companies. And last but not least, Dr. Hiroaki Kitano. Hiroaki is professor at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, also known as OIST, and then also president of the Systems Biology Institute, president and CEO of Sony Computer Science Laboratories, executive vice president of Sony Group Corporation, and CEO of Sony AI. He is also a founding trustee of the RoboCup Federation, president of the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence, a member of the AI Robotics Council and Quantum Computing Council of the World Economic Forum. He received the Computers and Thought Award from the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence in 1993, Pre Ars Electronica 2000, Design Award 2001 from Japan into Design Forum, a Nature Award for Creating Mentoring in Science in 2009, as well as being an invited artist for Biennale di Venezia 2000 and Museum of Modern Art New York in 2001. He has been named a fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence for 2021. Welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. So now let's get into the to today's uh, main topic. And I would like to start by asking uh, uh, a moment ago to make an opening remark, but with the following question in mind. But around the globe, there's a strong focus on, on decarbonizing the power sector as early as 2035 as a measure to uh, mitigate against climate change. Is that a feasible target? And also, um, how do you see TEPCO and other utilities responding to this vast change away from carbon-based energy systems? And what new business models are emerging in order to realize this target? Monko? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this US Japan Council's webinar. I am Momoko Nagasaki. My hairstyle is slightly different from photograph, but I am one. So, um, <laughs> let me first briefly tell you about TEPCO. We cover business areas from generation to retail, and we are the biggest electric power company in Japan. In terms of sales volume, we supply more than 30% of Japan's electricity. On your first question, about decarbonization of power sector, it is a very challenging goal. I believe that this is um, important for the world to work together and take on this risk, take, take on this task. In Japan, the government set a goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050 and formulated strategy that green growth strategy with carbon neutrality in 2050. The 
the scale of the challenge requires a countrywide effort that includes the cooperation of all stakeholders. Utilities are also undergoing a major transition, and I believe that TIPCO is on a historic mission. On your second question about other response, about our response, we are aiming to develop our effort in three main areas, society, grid, and supply. I'd like to briefly explain some of our main initiatives in each area. We believe that this is important to take steps to achieve carbon neutrality in society. The first step is to visualize energy consumption on the customer side, reduce energy consumption by promoting energy saving and promote electrification in line with a reduction in a total amount of energy consumption. Then we aim to realize a carbon neutrality society by converting the energy supply side to renewable energy. In order to achieve this goal, five tools, which I call five star, are needed. Sensors for visualization, heat pumps, and EVs for energy conservation, and PV and storage batteries for efficient use of renewable energy. We are trying to spread these five stars through society. In the grid area, we are strengthening the resilience of transition, transmission, and distribution networks in order to reduce CO2 emissions and support the increased use of renewables. By leveraging digital technology, we can use distributed energy resources, DR, with maximum effectiveness and make the transition to a next generation disposed grid that is carbon neutral and resilient. On supply size, typical renewable power is engaged in hydroelectric, hydroelectric, hydroelectric power generation and wind power generation as future primary sources of energy. It aims, its aim is to establish new power sources on a total development scale of six to seven million kilowatt in domestic and overseas offshore wind, as well as overseas hydroelectric power projects by 2030. Finally, our business model thus far has been to sell electricity genera generated from large scale power plants through the grid. From now on, it will be important to develop businesses that provide energy, including facilities as a service. We believe it's necessary to provide distributed and autom autonomy, aut autonom excuse me, autonomous energy services to enable local pro production for local consumption based on the premise of distributed power sources such as solar power and storage batteries. Also, at the COP26 last November, U.S. Special Envoy for Climate Change, John Kerry, suggested that the technology and market for carbon neutrality are not yet matured and that there are many business opportunities. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Momoko. It's, it's very interesting that uh, you, you outlined three uh, different buckets, but society it was the one that I caught my attention because this is such a great undertaking that you need to involve all stakeholders and you know, including and in reducing energy consumption, which I thought was a uh, very interesting. So I'll <clears throat> follow up on that later on, but oh, by the way, audience uh, can post Q&A. So if you have Q&A, please input into uh, the Q&A box. So thank you, Momoko. So now I would like to turn to Gabriel. 
So Gabriel, um, so I want you to make a, a first remark, but then with the next que this question in mind. So what are the innovations at the intersection of technology, business, and policy needed for US and Japan to achieve their respective carbon-free sector goals? And, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about how Elemental and then also its international partnerships uh, helping to advance the US and Japan's resolve for carbon-free power sector. I'm happy to, and thank you for having me here. I would say that the uh, answer to your question is, of course, no, there's no simple answer. There's no single answer. Uh, the, the question is, is very large, as we talked about beforehand. Um, and, and there are lots and lots of answers to that question. I think from a policy perspective, uh, one of the key things is flexibility and, and a willingness to collaborate. I think from the private sector perspective, a key trait is flexibility and willingness to collaborate. I think that across all of this, there's going to have to be a lot of collaboration and speed to move quickly and test and try new things. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a part of Elemental Accelerator. We're an accelerator based in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, we work globally, however, and thank you for pulling that up. Uh, as it says on the, the screen, we're a nonprofit that was founded in 2009, and we work with early stage companies all across the world to try to build solutions to climate related problems with a particular focus on serving frontline communities or communities impacted first and perhaps worst by climate change as it's as it's happening already. Uh, so we really try to, as it says here, embed epi into everything that we do. Right now, we with companies on, I think, almost all of the continents, not quite all, on a variety of solutions across energy, mobility, water, food and agriculture, and, and sort of circular economy, as we call it. Um, those five buckets capture an awful lot of different ideas and technologies and approaches. But again, I think what they have in common in a lot of cases, and, and this actually speaks back just to Momoko's comments a moment ago, uh, to a focus on community, on engaging with people to develop solutions that will actually serve their needs and serve this bigger systemic level challenge that we face uh, around climate change. Um, so you mentioned also, how do we work with corporate partners and others? We have a program called Navigator in which we work with corporate partners all around the world to help our entrepreneurs and their new companies to scale up. And so sometimes that means testing a new technology in partnership with somebody like TEPCO. Other times it means creating new opportunities for the TEPCOs of the world to find solutions to problems they've already identified. Uh, but all of that comes back to sort of the things I started with, which is flexibility and a willingness to collaborate. And all of that leads to or can lead to speed of innovation, which at this point, I think we can all see is increasingly paramount. How do we quickly innovate? How do we click, quickly look for solutions tied to policy and technology to solve some of these <coughs> problems? With that, I'll, I'll stop my intro, but thank you. I'm glad to be here and look forward to more. Hmm. Thank you, Gabriel. So I think it's an important point that it's it's not only so it's power, but then it's you need to involve the community and then and technology and policy. It's it's not it's like a combination of effort, right? So it's great. Thank you. And then now uh, let's uh, ask Hiraki. Uh, hi, Hiraki. So uh, hi. please uh, provide um, your initial remark on this topic, but with a question. In, in mind. So what is the role of academia in helping nations such as Japan and US achieve carbon free power sector? And also in particular, uh, in your opinion, what are the most important technology, technological advancements that are needed to realize carbon free power sector? Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for giving me opportunity to participate in the uh, very important panel. And uh, you know, and okay, I think like uh, the question is very, very one is very important. How the academia uh, will be uh, able to play the uh, uh, critical role in uh, uh, decarbonizations and also like uh, sustainability in general. Uh, I, I think like uh, you know, the three key uh, in the role the academia will be able to play. One is a uh, uh, basic research. I mean, this is a really obvious thing. Uh, at the same time, uh, <clears throat> particularly important because we need more and more uh, technological advancement uh, in uh, decarbonization and uh, sustainability in general, uh, as well as like uh, uh, you know integrating some of the key discoveries uh, into the uh, feasibility study scale uh, system that to be deployed. I mean, uh, for example, like uh, 
uh, how we can achieve the uh, better, uh, you know, uh, power storage in terms of battery. What you know, what would be the uh, you know affordable and more efficient sort of for the Baltic or like a hydrogen storage or other method. I mean, uh, I think it's a lot more need to be uh, discovered and then have to be uh, developed. At the same time, uh, academia won't have like uh, you know muscle to deploy in a large scale. That is not necessarily the role of the academia. But at the same time, uh, should be able to deploy the uh, feasibility study level system as we do in the OIST. For example, like OIST has like a huge campus uh, in Okinawa. Unlike many Japanese universities, which is in, in reside in the city and don't have like, uh, you know, all the uh, land uh, they can actually uh, play with, uh, OIST have like a massive, uh, you know, campus. So what we have done uh, in OIST is actually uh, uh, deploy the uh, distributed power grid system and uh, DC microgrid uh, solar photovoltaic uh, powered and we provide the uh, 19 faculty housing uh, for the uh, electricity for the last five years. Okay, so this is not really the uh, uh, experimental house. This is the real house, uh, you know, the faculties and their families living, and we provide electricity for five years. And this level of the uh, feasibility study provide us the uh, insight and what is the uh, advantage of the uh, microgrid system? What is the uh, uh, what are the, uh, you know, the issues that we're going to have to see in the uh, future uh, for the mass scale, uh, large scale deployment. So uh, that that kind of uh, uh, experiments that we can do at the same time, because like uh, we are not bounded by the specific business domain. Now we can do the, uh, quite a bit of uh, integration study, for example, integration of the microgrid, integration with the mobility, integration with the uh, uh, thermal isolations, uh, you know, design, for example, uh, you know, the other experiment that we did, we the Japanese housing company in Misawa uh, was to have like a highly, uh, you know, uh, heat uh, insulating house so we can get the uh, quite substantial grid independency. Uh, so like uh, without uh, connecting to the grid, the house would be able to have a 26 uh, uh, degree all year round with the humidity of the 50 to 60 percent. And that's very comfortable. And uh, we achieved that in the OIST. Uh, that means like we can deploy this into the uh, tropical and uh, subtropical areas uh, with comfort. I mean, that, that kind of expense uh, we can do. And then we can uh, probably uh, work with the uh, major companies for the deployment as well as the setting up a startups to be able to go, uh, you know, play the big bigger game. And the second part is we should be able to, uh, academia uh, can contribute to the uh, conceptualizing what is the uh, integrations with the sustainability, decarbonization, and the economical concept. I would like to uh, mention so one very good study uh, by the uh, Cambridge University professor, Professor Das Gupta. And it was commissioned by the UK government and provided the, uh, submit the report, a uh, very uh, intense, like a 600 pages report where it's no uh, Das Gupta review. And uh, what he is proposing is the like, concept of the integrated wealth uh, of, of like uh, GDP, human resource, and a natural capital. And then uh, he's uh, proposing to use the uh, integrated wealth as uh, one of the uh, new economic measure uh, to achieve the uh, sustainable growth. And uh, that kind of conceptual thing, I mean, uh, you know, uh, academia, this is where the academia should be able to play a major role in the, uh, you know, uh, setting the new standard or, you know, providing a new vision, uh, you know, that actually not just technology, but the integrating economics and then all the uh, uh, policy index uh, uh, as well. And the third part uh, would be uh, the human resource. You know, this is going to be the bigger, uh, you know, initiative than the, like, uh, you know, uh, simple technology development. So we need to be able to uh, influence the people, uh, educate the student, provide the opportunity for the student to be aware of the sustainability and then uh, decarbonization and then how, what kind of a society we want to build in the future. So like uh, uh, having, uh, uh, you know, uh, course uh, for, uh, for our project or the sustainability in, in a larger scope will be very uh, important. When I actually, I'll be uh, starting a new course at the uh, uh, jointly with the uh, ICU and in, uh, KOSFC on the sustainability in the biodiversity. And we'll talk about the uh, uh, how we can achieve the uh, inclusive wealth and in a reality of the uh, energy grid and the sustainability issues and the biodiversities and uh, work with the uh, uh, SFC uh, folks and the KO uh, for their initial uh, attempt to have like a sustainable community building uh, as a really the practical example to see what are the visions, and what are the down to the earth reality uh, rather than the uh, just the talking about a uh, 
uh, things. And talking and doing is very different thing. Uh, uh, for the student to be able to understand uh, what the reality and what kind of uh, uh, opportunity and difficulty uh, we see in the head. Uh, I think that would be the major thing the academia uh, should be able to uh, contribute to this uh, uh, issue. Well, thank you very much. I'll stop here and uh, uh, you know uh, open for the discussions. Well, thank you, Hiraki. Well, that was a, a, a very good point. And then I really uh, understand that the piloting and then also conceptualization and human resources, and they're all really uh, important role that academia can play. And then also, you know, working with the startups and also the large corporations. And so this all interconnected. So thank you. So now I'm going to ask everybody and then kind of change of a, a tone and to more USJC specific question or US Japan related question per se. As I mentioned earlier, uh, last year in April, uh, the Prime Minister and the President Biden met and, and decided to start this US Japan <coughs> climate partnership. So I want to ask questions about this collaboration. So the first will be, why is this collaboration important in terms of US and Japan's ambitions towards a carbon-free power sector. Um, so, so maybe I can start with uh, Momoko. Yes. Um, why is it, is it important? Is it your question? Right? Yes, why, why is this important? OK. Um, in the transition to clean energy, ensuring energy security is an issue. And for the electric power industry, the continued use of natural gas and nuclear power is essential. I understand that the importance of this issue is shared by policy market in both Japan and the United States. In addition, the supply chain for minerals and materials necessary for the transition to clean energy is currently dominated by other countries, China. And it is important to focus on this issue and work to improve self-sufficiency. However, um, since lead time is required and risks are likely to remain for the time being, I believe that the Japan and the U United States should cooperate with each other to deal with it. Mm. Well, that's a very in interesting point. So it's not only about the end game, but in how it, during the in transition, there's a lot to collaborate. So, uh, so any any uh, any way you would like to add or your share your opinion on why this collaboration will be important? Yeah, maybe Gabriel. Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, I mean, I think that there there's a very easy short answer, which is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I actually think it's probably both of those things. We need to go fast and we need to go far. I think a lot of the onus right now, I mean, Momoko brought it up, the security piece, you know, having stable grids, having secure power supplies in countries all over the world is obviously something that's becoming really evident really fast right now, even if it wasn't already three days ago. Um, Looking at the bigger picture, I think there's a lot that the two countries can learn from one another, whether it's looking at things like offshore power generation. We both have coastlines. Both of us can generate power and learn from one another and go quicker together, scale quickly together. Uh, there are also obvious sort of differences around things like nuclear power and the way that our two countries have dealt with those. So I think that's an interesting thing. There's just lots of lessons we can learn from one another. Um, similarly, and someone brought it up in the chat with mobility, mobility is another huge generator of, of emissions, right? Uh, and the two countries have in many ways similarities, though also many differences. Uh, so for example, in Tokyo, you have an incredibly dense city where you can do a lot of really interesting things around public transit, micromobility, other things, though Japan hasn't actually got micromobility in the way that many US cities do yet in terms of shared and so forth uh, with scooter rules. I think the diet's about to <coughs> allow some things that hadn't been allowed but you know, the first scooter is launched here in 2018. And so it's a very different, like there are lessons that can be learned and can be improved upon and grow. Um, you know, one of the things I learned doing government relations for Lime was cities are always looking at each other and saying, well, how did, how did you handle that new thing? You have scooters on your streets now and we don't. What do, how do we learn from that? And I think the same is true here where the two countries can look at each other a lot and say, okay, you're innovating in that. What can we learn and quickly leapfrog, frankly, go ahead of you because you've learned these lessons already. How can we jump to the next lesson and then share that back to you? And I think that's 
increasingly crucial in a world as connected as ours is now. Mm, yeah, like the shared share the learnings and then help Absolutely. each other that way. Right? Yeah, yeah, lessons learned around industry, around what technologies are working, around what we can learn from technologies that didn't work, around companies that failed. I mean, failure is just as good a lesson in a lot of ways as success. And so how can we learn from what each other is doing and, and see the opportunities to grow? Mm. Thank you. So Hiroki, you, you yeah. Have a yeah. Right. I, I think like, uh, uh, you know, one uh, opportunity, a uh, very uh, tangible one is to work together, you know, in the Hawaii and Okinawa, for example, both are like, uh, you know, island place. And then there are limitations in what you can do, uh, you know, if that is an island. And uh, so like, uh, it would be uh, interesting, for example, our technology we built, like, you know, distributed microgrid system deployed in Hawaii in a uh, po possibly the larger scale. And then uh, see what would be the uh, configurations that makes like uh, things affordable and uh, practical. But we have learned uh, in a solar photovoltaic based the uh, distributed power system is like uh, you know it's very efficient and uh you know uh doable very practical at the same time if you have like uh, you know five days a very crowded day straight and you're gonna have a problem even you have like a battery i mean uh uh you know they're gonna be a problem like, you know it doesn't really generate during the night time so that like, we need like uh, you know power generations what we can do in the night time with like crowded days in the straight and uh, so like uh, you know what would be the energy mixture uh in terms of generation side uh would be and a very interesting challenge. You can probably add like a, you know, a hydrogen storage, large scale maybe, or you might have like a biomass or other things as well. Uh, like, but what are the sources? I, mean, I think like, you know, solar photovoltaic would be the one critical factor during the daytime at the same time. Uh, what would be the, uh, you know, key power generation source uh, for the nighttime and also like, uh, you know, uh, very bad weather if that continues for over three days. And that, you know, so we can uh, try out that in Okinawa in Hawaii, then we can actually what is like you know configurations, uh, w which is like a sustainable and then uh, you know uh, practical in terms of uh, cost issues, and then do it in Okinawa, do it in Hawaii, and distribute it the other place. I think that's not even not even if that is not the island. I, I think the same thing applied to like uh, you know suburb area. You know, I mean in uh, Tokyo and in uh, New York City, that would be a very different story because it's such a huge energy demand. Uh, but we, you know that would be a really bit different uh story but that seems like in most of the uh places people living uh we can actually uh, slightly uh, uh lower uh, population density energy demand and then uh, i think like uh, you know okinawa hawaii could be the really, really good the uh, model case uh, and we, we can get stuff from i mean i think that would be the uh, uh really uh, practical and, and a tangible thing we can put on our table well, thank you hiroki so i'm uh, Victor and I are based in Hawaii, so that that would be great. And then also, I think uh, that relates it relates to the third point in the U.S. Japan Climate Partnership, which is to help decarbonize um, other regions, third countries other than the United States and Japan together. Uh, for example, like Pacific Islands or Indo-Pacific regions, because that could be uh, like a way to show to the rest of the world because decarbonization. Uh, you know, you cannot just do Hawaii and Okinawa, but the, the, it's, um, you have to do it throughout the world. Otherwise, it doesn't really have, have an impact. So to be a showcase in, US, in Okinawa, Hawaii, or other regions could be a very uh, important uh, way to show. So because this is like a more specific, I wanted to uh, ask a follow-up question to Momoko. So for this collaboration, like what are the what are the some ways, like the specific ways that maybe Japan and US can support each other uh, uh, in collaboration to for this important quest towards a carbon-free power sector? Yes, um, other two mentioned already, I think um, one example is microgrid. Um, I believe that Japan and United States can cooperate in the development of technology to solve issues common to both countries to, for somehow example, um, I would say microgrid again. And we are, I mean, Japan is working on the transformation to a next generation distributed grid to achieve carbon neutrality and enhance regional resilience by utilizing 
utilizing digital technology and maximizing the effect use of distributed energy resources, means DR, such as renewable energy, storage batteries, and EVs, installed as regional system. In the United States, the construction and operations of microgrid, including the introduction of energy storage facilities and DR, has been progressing as a solution to a degradation of power quality caused by the massive introduction of new of renewable energy in the region. I so I, in recent years, as natural disasters such as the forest fires and hurricanes have become more serious, strengthening resilience through microgrid has become an urgent issue. So I believe that addressing the common issues of carbon neutrality and regional resilience will have great social benefits and that joint technology development between Japan and the United States will create um, synergies that will lead to innovation in next generation networks, I, I think. Mm. Well, thank you. So that, that's that's something that's going to be good. It's uh, similar to some, some of the things that Hiroaki mentioned as key technology. Uh, and then also, you know, climate change mitigation technology, such as microgrid, also used for climate adaptation in, in resilience. Yeah. Hiroki, why are you going to add? Oh, yes, I, I think like Momoko are pointing to the very important point. I think like, you know, the uh, uh, feature lies in how we can actually hybridize the connected microgrid uh, with the traditional grid system. I mean, in Japan, like a power company, the superb job in there are providing high quality electric city service because you know we don't have like a blackout you know we don't you know what well, we do sometimes but like, most most of the time like our electric system is perfect i mean we don't really have to worry about it at the same time like uh you know it's so well designed and then uh you know so that the uh, uh room for like uh, getting a more like a microgrid i mean have to make some effort i mean uh the issue is like if you have a solar photobook mega solar uh in a region then uptake into the main grid line would be limited so like you know for example like a kyushu electric have to cut off uh quite frequently recent years uh because like uh you know over generation uh from the solar photovoltaic facilities in the regions and they because they're, they're basically they're dumping electricity at the time and if you can you know if the power company decide to go for the microgrid uh, to absorb the solar photovoltaic uh, power generations uh, bring that to the local Local community, for example, rather than directly feed back into the main grid system, which will potentially destabilize the entire grid, and then they can actually have like a, you know absorber, like a, a kind of buffering system uh, from the, uh, renew the you know renewable system, and then isolate that impact to the main grid system while they are achieving the uh, uh, higher renewable ratio. And I think that would be uh, 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 best uh, system I can foresee, and then of course like uh, because. Uh, a microgrid able to uh, provide like a quite substantial uh you know renewable power i think it's burden uh for the uh, main grid to go for the uh, renewable uh, will be mitigated they can actually achieve much better renewable uh ratio uh than they are uh, supposed to supply it in everything from the main grid system i, I think it, but at the same time that means they have to have a new infrastructure for the microgrid i mean you can actually use the part of the uh local uh branch uh uh, to redistribute at the same time, they might actually need to uh, have like a, a new microgrid system uh, physically uh, in the region that will add up a cost. I mean, so like, uh, you know, uh, you know, what would be the uh, issue uh, of the uh, trade off uh, in between the uh, renewable ratio and then the cost issue they're putting uh, uh, a bit more like uh, infrastructure laid out in uh, local community uh, would be the issue. I, I think like I would like to add one more thing uh, along this line is not just looking at electricity, but also like a mobile Mobility and also the city design. So I think it would be very important to have like a, you know kind of like a prototype cities in a relatively large scale, not just like a 10, 20 houses, but like a one entire city uh, designed to be sustainable. And there's a lot of initiative like a Japanese trading firm actually doing the uh, thing in Indonesia or Vietnam or Thailand or those places. I would say like uh, uh, most of them try, trying to uh, 
seek for like a smart cities example for example but i i I'll, uh, suggest like uh, they look into the sustainable city or resilient city because this is the key and uh, what bring the uh, highest value would be the sustainability and the resilience i mean the smart thing is nice i mean that will come uh, naturally but at the same time what the fundamental value they can offer to the resident and the community would be uh, the sustainability and the resilience against like uh, all kind of perturbation that we see today Thank you. So that's very interesting because um, um, it's going to be related because the uh, some grid is so stable. If you want to introduce new things that, uh, for example, Elemental uh, helps to develop and bring in, and then how it's going to compete with existing infrastructure. And then maybe there's a role of policy that they're going to play. And then maybe the, you're saying that you have to tackle like a community or the smart city or citywide effort. But uh, very thank you very much. And and maybe from last question from me, and then, then I'm gonna shift to the audience question. But so what so my question is what is the role of corporations, NGOs, and academic institutions in setting carbon emission reduction targets of their own in supporting national decarbonization ambitions? This I'm I'm asking this so that you know, usually it's the first thing you come up, come to your mind is uh, maybe utilities because they produce uh, power. But what are the, the role of cooperation NGO and academic institutions in, in general in setting their own target? Maybe we can start uh, with Gabriel. Maybe. Sure, happy to. Uh, I think that it's sort of, again, the everybody has a part. And, you know, it, corporations have a role to play and are arguably pushing the market faster. As somebody GPA commented, you know, electricity for a lot of tech companies in particular is already pushing towards renewable, you know, goals of 100% and so forth. Um, I think that there is a market making aspect to that that is really important, saying that there is demand for this, whether policy is there yet or not, which in some countries it is, in other countries it really isn't there yet. So you needed those market signals to say, this is, this is something we need. Uh, but I think a lot of it goes back to we need kind of everybody contributing and tying back to the islands analogy, there's so much you can learn from each other, whether it's, you know, Japanese islands and American ones or Scotland, we can look to them to see what's happening with hydrogen and so forth. There's some really interesting lessons all over the place to learn from. Uh, at the end of the day, we, we kind of have to take all of them as fast as we can and you need innovators. And so to, to go back to an analogy with scooters launching into cities, there were some cities right at the beginning who said, yes, we're interested and we, we wanna see how this plays out. We wanna pilot, we wanna test, we wanna learn. There are other cities who said, absolutely not. No interest, do not bring those here. You need, you need those innovative places to push the needle on all of these things, whether it's power, microgrids, mobility tools. You need policymakers willing to, to experiment and to push the envelope of what's possible. And you need the corporations to play with them to achieve those innovations and to test them out. And again, some things will work and some won't, but we have to be going as fast as we can on testing them. And I think that's where corporations sending that market signal of we're going to buy renewables, that starts guiding policymakers, even if they're not otherwise toward policies that will set in place standards that are that become requirements. So I think I think it's all of the above. We need to be working together. We need to collaborate, and everybody needs to be pushing as hard as they can. Mm. Oh, great! Yeah, the collaboration and also everybody working together is is the key component. So so now let's uh, move on. To, oh, oh, here, here. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I think a collaboration from the uh, various. Uh... Uh, research domain and the business sector will be uh, key here. Uh, one thing is like we're talking about, you know, decarbonization and carbon neutral. At the same time, if in a, in a way to achieve that, you know, if you are not careful enough and you sacrifice the natural environment, for example, if you got like a large scale solar photovoltaic or like, you know, me sort of mega solar or, you know, other means like that might actually impact the environment as well. I mean, if you got like a, you know, a, you know, large solar, then and, you know all the soil and the needs of that in the concentrate in the shade and they have to you know de-weed i mean they have to do the agrochemical for example and that impacts the local uh, environment and then uh sometimes like uh, you know you have to cut the trees i mean that you know for you know for, for to get the solar so, you know if that will have to be concentrated you know of course like if you got like a rooftop i mean uh all like uh, you know roadside and all, all kind of uh, new areas i mean that that will be uh, available uh, for the sort of so that for the voltaic I mean, uh, that would be gigantic uh, area that you can use. At the same time, that means it's not concentrated. 
Okay, if you got a concentrated renewable, because the renewable, the thing spread, I mean, you need a big, bigger area. That will potentially impact the natural environment. So you, you're trading off like a biodiversity against decarbonization in that case. And that is not something we want to do. I mean, uh, you know, if you have to go to the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, power system on the other environment somewhere, like a, there are more artificial things there. It's not in a natural environment. Then they're more likely that you have to go to distributed power generation system. And that means like, uh, uh, you have to come up with like, you know, kind of a way to use the current grid or you have to have like a new, uh, infrastructure. You have the local microgrid, uh, independent line, and so that that I think there are trade off in between, uh, you know, decarbonizations, natural environment impact, and the cost. I mean, you know, I, I think we have to work together to solve that question. It's not just like only technology; it's on the business model. Uh, it, it's on the uh, much broader uh, sustainability issues, and then also the economics and how that impacts in you know, all the policy uh, issues in terms of electricity cost and then uh, uh, regulatory approval for the uh, uh, that that kind of scheme, I guess. And thank you, Hiroaki. So, so with that, with that, that's a very valid point. And then for the remaining time, maybe I'll just do a rapid questions from Q&A. Maybe you can uh, uh, try to answer in one minute, <laughs> if you can. So let me start uh, uh, with one question from the audience. So the question is this, what role do you think Japanese Sogo Shosha, like the general trading companies such as Mitsubishi, Mitsui, Sumitomo should play in coordination between business companies and connect technology innovation to business model in the context of US Japan co cooperation. Well, uh, maybe I should. Uh, uh, many uh, Japanese training firm are uh, trading on the uh, energy issues. I mean, uh, you know, for like uh, LNGs on the uh, uh, all, all kind of uh, uh, you know for trading as going on just uh, for the energy and as well as the uh, low materials, for example. I mean, I think like they can be more conscious. Uh, they are already, I guess, but like, conscious of the sustainability issues you now. What kind of power source? Uh, uh you know imports they're gonna have at the same time many of those the uh uh sogo Shosha or like a trading farm is trying to build like a cities now outside of japan you know i i know for example like a sumitomo has the uh, major project in the north of uh, hanoi for example and then uh you know other company has the uh, one in Thailand, Indonesia, and in other places as well. I mean, uh, they can actually build and design uh, very proactively in you know, a sustainable cities. I mean, uh, I, I think like uh, that that can be the reader model uh, for the future, and they can showcase the technology, and that will probably uh, accelerate their business in a very positive way. So I think you know if they really determine to create like a future, uh, you know, Sogo Social Trading Farm. Has a capability to do that. You know, trade, Japanese trading farm is a very unique business uh, style. I mean, they they trade everything basically, right? And so like they can be the really the produce like a designer for the future, and that 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 I think like there's a huge opportunity for them uh, to be able to shape the future. Great, great, thank you. And then oh, unfortunately, Momoko has to to leave. Right? So Momoko, -san, thank you very much. And do you you have any uh, parting thoughts, or if not? Um, Thank you for joining today and then we'd like to continue you know continue this discussion outside of this forum and using today's valuable discussion so thank you thank you for today so i can take uh, maybe one more question with the with the rest of you and um, uh, so the question is the transportation sector is the second largest source of co2 emissions after power production what plans does Japan have to use zero emission technology for transportation, including electric cars, trucks, and buses? But it, it's uh, it's targeted toward Japan. But since um, Gabriel, uh, I think you're familiar with transport. Can you uh, give us some insights on this? Sure. And actually, if I might, I might back up slightly to the Sogoshosha question as well. I think, I think an opportunity with, in particular, big corporations is to work with startups to test things. So startups are constantly innovating, coming up with new things, and they need somewhere to go and pilot them and try them. Uh, so I think there's a really unique opportunity for collaboration between startups and really large companies. Setting that aside to the mobility question, uh, I think you know there's there's a lot of regional variation. So if you look to Europe, for example, right now what we're seeing is a lot of innovation around small form factor vehicles, bicycles, electric cargo bikes, three wheeled, small four wheeled vehicles, lots and lots of innovation. 
In the US, the focus is very heavily on electrification of existing types of vehicles, trucks largely, and, and cars. Um, I think that there are lots of opportunities all over the world to take the best of all of these things. Visible globally, we can see what each other is doing. Gives us the opportunity to learn very quickly from what's working and what's not. So, for example, in Tokyo, I would imagine cargo bikes being an amazing asset. I would imagine shared bikes and shared scooters and the next wave of little things that move people around in cities being a great tool uh, for somewhere like like Tokyo or Kyoto or something like that. Uh, I compare to you know Hokkaido. You're still going to be probably still going to need those things as well. So how do we electrify as quickly as we can and build out the infrastructure, whether it's the charging infrastructure or the actual vehicles themselves? So I think there's a lot of opportunity to innovate very quickly. And then you have the, I guess, the main meaning big question, especially with Japan, is around the hydrogen side of things. Toyota obviously has placed a lot of emphasis on hydrogen, and I think the government as well. Um, but if you look to the rest of the world, largely on cars anyway, it seems to be moving away from hydrogen and toward elect electrification. So how do Japanese firms catch up on that or, or lead on that again? Uh, and similarly, then how do they integrate new form factors into things? Thank you, Gabriel. Um, Hiroaki, you have a comment on the, the transportation. Well, I, I think like a mobility is the key issue. I mean, all the electrification is like a one major trend. Like the question is you know, uh, where this electricity came from. They have to be renewable sources. And otherwise, things just uh, shifting things around. Uh, at the same time, I'll say from the technology point of view, uh, even though uh, we shift uh, quite substantially into the uh, electric vehicle, uh, I hope that like, we can continue to, uh, you know, hold the technology for the internal combustion engine. I mean, uh, in a very efficient one, a very sustainable uh, next generation internal combustion engine, because like always you have to have a backup. I mean, uh, you know, of course, like uh, it doesn't mean like we should deploy into the, you know, commercial vehicle, but at the same time, like, uh, you know, if anything happens, we might have to revert to like, uh, you know, ICE, internal combustion engine. Uh, at the back of energy source. I mean, uh, so like uh, that would be the plan B option. I think like a technology uh, need to be kept. I mean, uh, so that that's a kind of, a, uh, uh, you know, the very difficult issue of uh, if you don't have like a big market, then how you keep the technology. But I think like you have to find a way to have like a extremely efficient and then uh, cleaner. Uh, of course, it's not going to be completely clean, uh, but a cleaner uh, internal combustion engine uh, for the rainy days. And uh, and then at the same time, like a mobility need to be integrated with the city. And then, uh, you know, uh, I, I think like a whole design issue of the community will be critically important. And so that actually, I come back to the issue that uh, this uh, Sogo Shosha can play in the big role. If they have like a really uh, strong design mind and they have like a in, uh, in depth insight uh, into the future, I think they can play the huge role. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hiroaki. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. If I may, uh, uh, yep. yeah, just a quick comment on that. I think I think your point is really well made around the power behind EVs. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting is looking at the other side of infrastructure, which is cities, for example. How do we build so that we don't need such giant mobility vehicles to move us around? Um, and I think your internal combustion comment is really interesting. I was recently listening to a, a British uh, British person who was talking about this specifically, and his comment was. In 2040, if you go to somebody and say, we want an internal combustion engine, they may well turn to you and say, well, we can 2021 technology, or we can build a very expensive new version using 2040 technology. But the reality is the innovation sort of focus has shifted or is shifting. And so I think your question is really interesting. What are the backup or redundant systems if we have transitioned fully away from internal combustion to continue moving? And I think a lot of that goes back to walkable cities, infrastructure, and so forth. No, this this is a beginning of very exciting discussion. So we have more questions from the audience, but I guess we will you know, there will be the start of the dialogue and let's let's continue uh, both sides in the United States and Japan to to discuss this issue. So this concludes the panel portion. Thank you, Gabriel and and Hiroaki and then Momoko. So I turn it back to to you, Suzanne. Okay, thank you so much, Naoki. And yeah, that was a very, very rich conversation. Um, you know, I woke up this morning and read the IPCC latest report, and it's very daunting to think about what we're up against. So I really appreciated the chance today to focus on a what seemed like a narrow, more narrow topic, the power sector, but we saw a lot of the um, angles get brought in. And I think the key is for us to come together, help define the problem, bring the right experts into the conversation. And we made major steps towards that today. 
Um, I really loved the messages we heard about the importance of flexibility and being willing to collaborate and also to do things in a way that engage the community. And I, I, I hope we get to some of that further in, in future discussions. But today, I just wanna thank the speakers for giving us some very really practical examples, uh, talking about potential partnerships, especially at the subnational level, Okinawa, Hawaii, or maybe in third island, um, third nation island countries, but also tons of inspiration. Um, so that was really fantastic. I also wanna thank the audience for the questions and the comments in the chat, because I think a lot of those were rich and can give us um, topics for future conversation. So my final remark, besides appreciation to all of you, is just to say, I hope that um, each and every one of you will continue to be part of this conversation, whether you participate with US Japan Council or with your colleagues at PICTER or through the OIST Foundation, all three of us look forward to um, continuing to work together in various ways of partnership. So please stay engaged, give us your ideas, give us your questions. And in the meantime, I hope you all have a wonderful evening, afternoon, or, or rest of your day, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us.